So hello everybody, welcome. I am for those of you online. Uh, I oops, I have to pay us to the recording. Sorry. For those of you online, my name is Marta Gutman. I'm the dean of the Spitzer School of Architecture. Okay. And tonight, I'm delighted to welcome you to the last lecture in the in our fall lecture series. Uh, uh, border Crossings, Architecture, and Migration in the Americas. This is a Siami lecture series. It's made possible by the Spitzer Architecture Fund and the generous support of, support of Frank Siami, uh, class of 74, and CEO of Siami Construction. So as is our want, we'll begin by acknowledging that the Spitzer School of Architecture, grounded on the bedrock outcrop of Harlem, is situated upon the ancestral homeland of the Munsi Lenape, Wappinger, and Wequazajek peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obliged to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed our college to grow and thrive on a vibrant terrain. As de designers and thinkers, we endeavor to build in ways that lead toward justice, and we are committed to working to dismantling the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. So it's been my honor and privilege to work with Dr. William Brinkman Clark to curate this series. And as I mentioned, this is the last series. And before we move on to today's lecture, I just ask you to join me in thanking William for joining our school and making the series possible. So William's been a visiting scholar here at the Spitzer School coming to us from Yunnan in Mexico City and bringing this wonderful, helping bring this wonderful array of speakers to us. And now I would like to ask my dear friend and colleague, Professor Ali Hochak, to introduce our guest speaker uh, and the topic and his lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Martha, for inviting me to make this introduction. And uh, also, I thank you, William, for your efforts in putting together, together with Mark and the series. Um, bear with me for a second. Uh, so I am Ali Herjek. I'm adjunct professor of architecture here in the School of Architecture at Spitzer. Uh, this is the last lecture, as Martha has said, of our migration theme series. During these talks, we have heard from several colleagues practicing in Mexico. Concurrent with these lectures, two of our studios have collaborated in some form with students at UNA, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, designing in response to migration. It is therefore fitting that we end the series with tonight's speaker, Arturo Ortiz. Arturo is an architect, writer, urbanist, artist working in Mexico City. He studied architecture at the Universidad Ibero-Americana and did his graduate studies in urbanism at UNAM. Arturo is founder and director of his studio, Taller Territorial de Mexico, as well as executive director of his family-run construction and development company. His practice is diverse. It moves among different scales, idioms, and collaborations. These range from architectonic constructs and urban planning to the design of interiors and artistic works. Both his artistic and architectural works have been exhibited internationally, including at the Venice Biennale, the Contemporary Art, Triennial and Gontro, as well as the Cooper Hewitt here in New York City. He was also invited to be part of the Ordos 100 project of 100 proposed houses in Mongolia, curated by Ai Weiwei and Herzog and Dumero. Arturo has published widely in a variety of forms, forums and platforms. In 2012, he won the prestigious Faces of Discrimination National Journalism Award for his article, From Architectural Discrimination. He has received fellowships with several institutions and has taught at schools of architecture in both Mexico and the United States 
and has lectured in the Americas, Europe, and Eastern Asia. Arturo is a member of the National System for Art Creators, or FUNCA, a program which establishes collaborations among the artistic community, government agencies, and the public. Together with Rosana Montiel, he was a recipient of the Holstein Foundation PhD research grant for his work, Sustainability in Poor Areas, Himakuakan Informal Squatter Settlements. His accomplishments are certainly widely recognized and uh, many. Having invited Arturo to speak to our students two years ago and through subsequent conversations, most memorably over dinner in Mexico City with professors Horn and Stisgard, when we discussed his designs for informal housing, I've come to see Arturo's work as centered in the human condition conveyed through his urban designs, architecture, and art. These are less about solutions and more about inquiry, looking to reveal in a Hegelian manner the underlying flaws and fragilities of ideologies and provoking us to question our built environments. These inquiries are identified in his work as territories, inequalities, and voids, defined by things like the architecture of security, and surveillance, migratory movement, or the imminent swirl of paint slowly dripping from his canvases. As the scholar Jose Luis Barrios wrote so eloquently of Arturo, and from which I will paraphrase, it is impossible in so little space to account for a problem as complex as that of the relationship between art, aesthetics, and migration. There are many ways and strategies with which art has approached it. However, here, I would like to venture some reflections on a practice. To show the victim through art, as Primo Levi did, falls into an ethical paradox. Insofar as it requires the witness to give an account of the victim, perhaps for this reason, in this register, Art is not able to account for the victim. But what we are left with, what we can do, is to show the perverse logics that produce such acts against humanity. For the current efforts of our students here and at UNAM, and for the career of tonight's speaker, these words couldn't be more fitting. So please welcome me, uh, or welcome our friends, uh, and, uh, Thank you very much, Annie. I, I get nervous to hear your presentation. <laughs> so let's try to. I, I'm nervous just thinking I wonder who you are. <laughs> well, thank you, Maria, uh, Ali, Martin, William, for inviting me uh, to share my experience with you. Uh, I apologize uh, for speaking such bad English, but most of all, I apologize to speak about myself. I always try to explain a context and establish a knowledge field in which we can have a debate. Um, but this time I will talk about my uh, myopia and the pale architecture and urbanism have meant for me and the ways I try to emancipate them from them. On migration, I think, it, that is impossible to describe or represent this phenomenon without imposing values and gazes. Migrants have to deal with two uh, systems and major players in Mexico when they uh, cross through the country. The institutional systems that see them as the numbers and statistics, and the heterogeneous organized crime uh, that see the migrants as commodities. Both players take out humanity from them. So what will be a way to recover the human condition facing both systems? And most of all, what can architecture do? In my experience, migrant spaces are represented in two versions. The institutional representation consists of refugee camps or migratory states, very similar to jails, and crime space representation, factories, slavery works, in mines uh, or brothers. In a refugee camp, they have human rights, but they are not citizens and they can't work 
uh, or have a functional lifestyle and move freely through the cities. On the other hand, in the crime space, they potentially can lose every right. On representative kind of spaces also exist, but we cannot see them very easily. Uh, also, we can think of the border as a symbolic space for migration, the huge wall between two countries. But for me, the wall is basically nothing. The real border is located where the body of the migrant gets in touch with authorities. What is most important for me is to see how heterogeneous, diverse, unrepresented, underrepresented, fictionalized, exoticized migration is, and at the same time, how invisible it is. Uh, how to approach to this phenomenon uh, from architecture or urban theory? What I learned about architecture and urban theory, it is the necessity for building a gaze on the context in which we are going to intervene in the future. Before we design a piece of architecture or urban plan, we have to learn about the context and create a narrative of the way the built environment could interact with the city. Urban social and natural information, among many others, contribute to creating a knowledge field able to explain with precision why we bring up a particular design, design that responds to a specific context. Sometimes this information comes from a technical perspective, sometimes comes from a conceptual framework. At the end of the day, we need this information to describe the reasons why architectural design develops in a particular way. From urban theory or urban design perspectives, uh, lots of information from different origins play to produce a case and a knowledge field. Demographics, economic, natural environments, bureaucratic processes, regulations, and an endless list of technical uh, issues should be considered before we take any planning or urban design proposal or decision. Perhaps the only thing I learned about architecture and urban theory uh, as a student first and then as a professional is the manner to establish a gaze or a knowledge field on the context and constitutes my principal and probably my only interest in architecture and urban theory. So I will share with you how I see the territory of Mexico, which is the context of migration. I will show you some uh, places I have been, and I ask you to do an intellectual exercise trying to imagine a way to do a written description of any picture you will see. Then we can imagine the meaningful and lifetime experience for best or worst of a migrant or many migrants. The environments in my country are more than intricate. Being simplistic, I can tell that Mexico is a complex system shaped by lots of social, economic, political and market dynamics that not necessarily responds to democratic values. As any other complex system, there is autoregulation of all the dynamics to the nation. Still, this autoregulation does not respond to sustainable development or city civil rights, or does not attend to regulations and normativity. Instead, the territory is mainly defined by corruption and impunity. If we go further to analyze my country, we will find a problematic structure where people have no access to their rights, where violence is a practical way to negotiate between interests, where it is allowed the distribution of organized crime, where extravism in mines leads urban and regional dynamics, where crime rates point out a 95% of impunity on registered crimes, and where governments lack regulations and they are unable to deal with demographic growth and behavior. Facing territorial complex systems, uh, disciplines such as architecture and urban theory end up being precarious without the capacity to create a significant changes in the city and city and the regions. Disciplinary boundaries lead architects and urbanists to interact with the context in a very predictable way. In, and in Mexico, most architectural design or urban planning pro projects end up being cliche. I must say that I keep doing architecture, but, but most of all, urban planning on different scales, but basically on regional, regional scale. From my point of view, these disciplines cannot solve almost any aspects of the territorial complexity where they play. And my critique com comes from a practitioner and not from an outsider. Perhaps 
It's easy to explain Mexico as a complex system by mentioning how its biological evolution does not correspond and is not synchronized with uh, demographic aspects. As a whole, they are not synchronized with the productive and extractive dynamics, with the growth of urban structures or with the administration of the tropic areas, much less with the speed and capacity of bureaucratic actions. If we add to the equation the multitude of related aspects, the problem becomes increasingly intricate. For example, if we incorporate aspects such as corruption and historical government inefficiency, aspects such as the profits derived by territorial conditions in negotiation uh, that exist between different actors, mining concessions, aquifer concessions, uh, wealth for fracking concessions, and cultural production, real estate speculation, industrial dynamics, traffic of people, and drug trafficking, and many others, the precarious conditions of many rural communities, urban localities with basic deficiencies and in infrastructure and equipment, with an absence of uh, job sources without the ability to create decent jobs that offer social security benefits, pollution, technical and budgetary shortcomings, shortcomings that have exacerbated the problem uh, in this administration, uh, in the current administration, organized crime, of course, violence and insecurity. The result is that the territorial systems in Mexico are not only diverse, but profoundly complex. On, on this environment, streams of migrants achieved to cross from border to border. Architectural and urban disciplinary boundaries are the essence of being an architect and an urbanist, and these boundaries define them. But they constitute a problem for me, because as I told you, my main interest has been creating a knowledge field on the context. And I can see the uselessness of these discipline, disciplines when we expand our gaze to territorial complexity. In the end, it became a question for me about the way I can interact with, with such intricate environments by other means. I think that what is visible is much more than what can be said. From these words, I find that architecture and urban theory as a day, as a discipline able to direct our sights to specific things as a zoom, but that is at the same time not the rest. I like to imagine a metaphor where these disciplines are a huge telescope able to zoom on a star far away and lose sight of the universe at the same time. I like to study the blurred part. And my question is about my epistemological approach. As you can imagine, my approach cannot be from architecture and urban theory. First of all, because architecture can produce, can be produced without interfering with the blurred part, or probably just can feel it. Second, because these disciplines always try to intervene in solving programmatic aspects and the space demand through design and from a panoptic vision. But my interest is not to solve anything but witness in terms of effective learnings. Probably my only personal, is my only proposal is a systematical and a, an epistemological approach to territories that consists of putting my body in the middle of the complexity. And I mean, it's all this picture I took, and this is when I say I've been there, it's because I've been there in a space without representation between places with representation. But from this unrepresented kind of spaces, I try to produce narratives, alternative narratives. My only objective is to collect the way I perceive things there and describe it through different means and media. I put myself in territorial interest, interstices, in the exact place where representation is a vacuum, where disciplinary approaches lack element to establish an academic or professional narratives, places where political agendas look like a joke and bureaucratic procedures are extremely ridiculous. But these approaches to places have a deep emotional border. So my gaze is not objective at all. My subjectivity travels to my eyes and ears to my skin and nose, and I like to think that I build myself as an emotional source of the spaces with no previous representation. In projects such as Behind the Wall, I went behind the walls of some peripheral large gated communities, new neighborhoods, with thousands of little houses far away from the city structures and without any other urban use but social housing. I went to see places where a murder was done just behind the wall and 
In that precise place, I try to make a written description, a photographic exercise, and sometimes drawings. In this project, I found the bathroom as a whole where everybody, anybody can do every, anything without consequences. But social housing and the project behind the wall are just one of the, my teams. I have been in job dealing with the neighborhoods in formal settlements for more time than a decade, irregular dumps, migrant spaces, mines and productive areas, land extensions dominated by the organized crime, etc. In the recent past, I visited the territory known as La Huasteca through five states of Mexico, La Cuenca de Catalualpa, from Chiapas Heights to the Tabasco Coast. I visited all the communities in the state of Quintana Roo. Most of them, my, my communities, I went to Campeche and Yucatan, traveling around, doing overlanding, driving alone or with a friend for hours, having meals in amazing place, places defined by conflicts. I have been doing um, it for the last 25 years. Not all, all of these years I was conscious of doing it. But please don't get me wrong, I also like to sit in beautiful places and to do observation exercises in cityscapes, tourist area, uh, areas, and amazing landscapes. What is known and represented as nice areas in cities and landscapes. From my point of view, everything plays to conform spaces in Mexico, and I must say that I enjoy traveling around and discovering places. When I am in the field, I like to describe anything I see. Animals, I write about the rhythms that I distinguish, the tonalities of nature, and those of the built environment. I distinguish and draw the patterns that I find. I describe the sounds that I hear. I try to locate where any flows goes. I try, I write all the words I can read. I imagine what happens underground through the drains and pipes, the underground paths of ants. And sometimes I pick up images of things I find, plastic, toys, condoms, a lot of garbage, clothes, and shoes that were abandoned in no one lands. I describe the wind, my surrounding noises and smells, and I like to see vestiges of human dynamics that no one imagined, such as, the, uh, as little pathways that I can, I call senderos. I like to write about the interstice that inhabit Mexico. I see those things anywhere one dog, and I think that this is beautiful and powerful because places are full and empty at the same time, and somehow they have a large number of possibilities to be inhabited and abandoned. After visiting several places around Mexico, when I, I am at my studio, I produce writings, paintings, objects, maps, videos, photographic sequences, and anything can happen. I always produce with the materials at hand and without dropping any kind of representation. My work appears suddenly and is shaped by memories, space textures, and feelings. I don't try to respond to any agenda, just let the flow of my imagination, my visual and manual skills. I do it without any overarching theory. I just just to feel materials and play with them. There is a physical sensation when I work with different materials. In my opinion, it's, it is a sensation of autonomous from rhythm. It is the flow of the hand and the eyes where the, this sensation is more interesting than the art world itself. It is pure feeling. I can decide what to do in an artwork and rationally have techniques to do it better, but it is the flow of the senses that generally reveals what I think and who I am without uh, being able to rationally control it. Uh, it undresses me, but above all, it is an action that liberates me from reason. And basically I do it just for fun. Working with my hands and my eyes I allow, allows me to stop thinking and of course, and this is very important, step far away from the rationalistic approach of architecture and urban theory. The pieces I make, I make are done to work alone as a unique artwork with its own aesthetic potential. Sometimes I have success in this, sometimes I don't. But I don't really care because behind any creative exercise, there is part of my experience, says in field, that appear and show a narrative on a territory that in a way I cannot control, even if I am producing it. Probably when Lacan points out how the real appears on a person, even if this person is not willing to accept or be part of a specific narrative or situation. 
An example of the veil is when former President George W. Bush accidentally mixed up the invasion of Iraq with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in a recent speech. So media refers to the mistake as a Freudian slip in terms of what can be the view. Exactly, this is the way my work shows it's all itself in front of me. Even when I am not trying to express anything in particular, somehow, somehow my artwork is produced through, the, through my blindness. Some art pieces next to each other can create a dialogue between them, and they can show a better in the case, multi layered. Uh, multi layered reality that explains the complexity of the territories. Sometimes I think that my job is to show the place of the invisible to achieve the construction of the visible. When I bring some of the art pieces together to dialogue between them or with a particular notice in media, a kind of much more complex feel appears, and then I can control particular narratives. When spectators can understand the territorial complex system through my artwork, if I have success, they develop a kind of feeling in which they see a problematic environment where they distinguish the impossibility to change complexity within everyday life. When I can manage to do that in an exhibition, then I see value in my artwork because I perceive that somehow uh, my uh, a knowledge I share that comes from my will that appears can affect the feelings of others. But I want to share with you some of uh, some examples of the artwork that And so the Walking Dead is, a, is part of a series in which I did digital prints on the pages of antique English Spanish dictionary that belongs to my grandfather. I selected some words from the dictionary and then choose images that place with the words. In this case, I find on these pages, the words oppress, oppression, oppressive, and oppressor. And I selected the images at the image, did some modification to it, and then printed. A year later, I found a media picture of migrants caravan, of the migrant caravan, uh, that reminds me that for many people, migrants represent a complete otherness that can be imagined as the zombies of the walking dead. A huge mass of bodies will invade our countries and our imagination. When we speak about migration, we imagine always a kind of massive invasion. But what happened to individuals? For most migrants, the main feeling is loneliness. They can try to cross in Mexico and across institutional systems and the strength of the organized, organized crime, and they will be seen as objects. Ill after use is a piece that, I, that belongs to, this, to a series named Target that locates the way the system see, see them, in this case, as a commodity. John Doe, I don't think that you can see it very well, is a minimal drawing in which we can see steps and then something happen, happens that the person walking disappears, such as thousands of people in Mexico that disappear without a trace, leaving a trace or leaving a clues. A lot of them are migrants. But migrants move across walking trails and there is in Spanish. And I find a, a series of, and I did a series of drawings that recover the complexity and beautiful geometry of senderos. They can shape amazing drawings on land. In the picture, you will see a sendero next to Tijuana. These are spaces for migrants, but also I like them because they are out of the representation of the space for migration. They are, they are not in the maps, they are invisible for the visions. I think we should start thinking on migration from there. Another minimal drawing traces the principal route from the municipal Alpa to Los Angeles in a way look like a sendero of the mental walking uh, trail. But of course I have to go there and try to make a description of a, of a sendero in the middle of nothing. In this case, you can see a picture I take in Tula Hidalgo in the, at the periphery of Mexico City. Uh, on these walking trails, you can find how the environment has been colonized by people walking. Uh, they leave garbage and a multitude of vestiges that, that create a kind of new layer of land 
an artificial and fragmented one. And I hate it on one hand but, uh, because of the pollution, but on the other, I love because you can see a homogeneous layer shaped by a fraction of things uh, that create also geometric shapes between them. So I produce a series of objects in, with synthetic resin to form the stitches that can shape geometries between them and remind us of the diverse and strange kind of things that we can find throughout the country. We can find vestiges or future vestiges in Nyongos. Nyongos are places where migrants live in and spend most of the day, each day of the year in Tijuana. They are holes in the earth, cavities in infrastructure, or, or a bed in a tree. They, uh, they try to be invisible and they are not part of institutional representation for, for migrants. They are not in, on the map. They don't have an address, but they are probably the principal space where life flows every day. I create proposals for Nyongos, but the idea is not to produce them as an architectonic piece, but to obey such human conditions. So I did these pieces with cotton paper shaping different possibilities. Probably this is the only creative exercise that I can link with architecture, but with a difference. Architects are supposed to solve the space problems, and I don't. I create architectural forms without solving any problems. But I was able to imagine new ways to, uh, of the built environment, as you can see, different options to stay hundreds of days and nights in Tijuana, in Tijuana's field can be created, but will not solve an institutional or individual problem. They are spaces that are out of representation. With the same technique, I produce the institutional space, but also the main imagined place for migration phenomenon, which is the wall. So I did a model of a fragment of the wall in the middle of, of the desert and the ridiculous built environment that represents, at least in terms of natural flows. I took this image in, Tij in Tijuana in, and the border allows electrical flows, but not natural ones. And at the same time, I, it's like the last spot where vestiges can be found. It seems like a wall literally stop garbage and violence appears as a dark poetic metaphor. The wall stops the disposable for the imagination. And this could be people, animals, or garbage. Walls have been a common theme for me. I did uh, this little wall with mini bricks that I got in Colombia. From my point of view, this wall is a synthesis of the division and discrimination that we can find in, and represent uh, in represented spaces throughout Mexico and in the border. It's easy to think of, of the wall on the border, and sometimes from the US, south of the border is a dark place with walking beds. But for Latin Americans, the dark side and the humanized place can be the US. South of the border speaks about that. Mexico is a country divided in socioeconomic, cultural, and legal layers. In my imagination, I see walls between things. I have been producing walls in many manners, intervening books. In this case, it was a, a contemporary art book. And I must say that, I, that contemporary art in many cases is a boundary between the high culture and the popular one. And I question if I want to be part of this world. And I question to myself where I am supposed to show my work and to whom. But as long as the wall in the border is a reference for all as a larger, bigger, and stronger wall, the truth is that I started to work with the idea of walls from my approach to the social housing in Mexico. In the picture, you will see the vacuum behind the wall of a social housing new neighborhood. Uh, this is a recent photo in Chacumal, Quintana Roo, in the south of Mexico. Behind the wall, there is nothing but in unimaginable kinds of clothes, dogs, cats, rats, teenagers doing graffiti, getting high or fighting. If we go deep in these places behind the wall, we will find crimes and murders without any legal consequences. If there are any kind of surveillance, it will be looking inside the neighborhood and not to the outside, which is out of the represented spaces. I did cartography about uh, a series of news of murders in these places, and then I produced these images with the exact location of the murder and the news read. I went as well to some of these places and did a written description of the place uh, to see how the vacuum and emptiness 
leads everything. Two years later, a piece of national white news informed about the trailer left behind the wall of a new social housing neighborhood with a hundred dead bodies inside. Uh, they were left by the authorities because the refrigerators in the morgue were saturated. And someone came, came up with a brilliant idea to leave them where they can be invisible behind the wall. And they were, but the smell was sordid and reports of neighbors started to extend through different media. Sometimes reality is a whole fiction. The aerial picture shows how large new neighborhoods and, and how are, they are located in the middle of nothing and surrounded by emptiness. In the last two decades in Mexico, they built at least 16 million houses under this scheme. Nevertheless, I was intrigued by the patterns from aerial views and I was searching for other patterns to work with doing references to social housing in Mexico when I found accidentally a, uh, an aerial view of Arfitz concentration camp. And as you can see in the picture, they look alike with the way we, with a way we talk a new neighborhood. I work with a lot of patterns, such as this image of, of a public intervention on the Mexico City subway that I did in 2008 with the name OCD housing. I learned how any urban design uh, of these neighborhoods was efficient and the designers didn't see the people. They dehumanized their residents in order to respond to mathematical obstruction to get to the profit goal. Federal re regulation pushed developers to do that through different public policy. Space is produced and designed by rational abstractions. So I started a series named Abstracted Space. This particular piece was exhibited in London. But in my opinion, people cannot live in such abstractions and they manage to transform them. Progression is a digital graphic showing that life cannot be that administrated even less in the imagination of a team of architects or urban designers. But, but uh, the people who live in these neighborhoods will invest a lot of time to reshape these places and make them more flexible and easygoing how to break the space, the space limitation built and how to create an heterogeneous environment. Can they really manage to do that and at what time? These architectural and urban limitations produce spaces for violence, surrounded by emptiness where crime happens without consequences for criminals. I think social housing in Mexico is a way to produce a systematic violence a built environment that offers every opportunity to break the law. Nevertheless, violence is represented as a, as a dualistic issue where the good ones are fighting with the bad guys. When we hear about a piece of violent news, the government narrative is always the same. A band of drug dealing was, um, was fighting for the control of a territory against another band of drug dealers. And the drug lord behind everything was a chapel who now lives in New York, like jail. Uh, in, in this inkjet print on a newspaper, the Joker plays to unveil how political narratives end up being basic, dichotomic, and hard to believe. El Chapo is represented in a series of Netflix and uh, various telenovelas. Uh, there is an aestheticization of this image, thinking of that idea of photographs of bullets trying to produce flowers of bullets with the idea, uh, with this idea to play with the aestheticization of violence. Also, I did a, a little paintings showing the everyday news on Twitter, finding horrible images that seem invisible, but they are uh, strong and powerful and they are precisely in the interstices of, and the emptiness of our territory. Some of these paintings were put behind a iridescent mirror to shape four geometrical objects with amazing colors. The spectators can, be, uh, can see something behind the mirror, but they have to get closer to the mirror to see the paintings. As a result, they will see the crime scene of, the, of my painting over the reflection of their faces. Crime, militarization, and femicide are behind the mirrors. 
I try to locate what happens in the faces of others, because at the end of the day, we are all part of a violent environment that seem to disappear in, in the everyday life. Femi, uh, femicides is probably the deepest evidence of how the social contract is lost. In 2007, I did an intervention in public spaces named Signals at the Chim Chimalhuacan municipality with collab uh, in collaboration with the artist and activist Lorena Walker. We leave a board with information on gender violence in the place where 11 femicide happens. 11 femicide institutionally accepted, but in that time there were tens more femicides according to media reports. The piece was in the context of a contemporary art exhibition in the Mexico City Museum and was financed by the Human Humex Foundation. At the museum, we didn't show the public intervention at, at all. Instead, we just leave a graphic with the names of the 11 women killed and, lo and the location where they appear and the date. The question is how the built environment contributes to violence and particularly to gender violence. We found that in the new social housing neighborhood statistics shows an increase in family and gender violence is high above the national average. Next to Lorena Walker and photographer Federico Gama, we did this public intervention with a billboard showing how, how urban design next to a vacuum of laws and social contracts uh, lost produce violence. But it shouldn't be a surprise to speak about the uh, space and violence. 20% abandoned house, houses is a piece where I point out the abandoned houses in three different big area pictures of three different new social housing neighborhoods. The pieces fix out how at least 20% of the of these little houses are abandoned across the country. It reveals the mathematical abstraction abstractions and not leave the urban design and how violent could be the houses, the architecture and the urban design. Social housing and migration play a role in the violence of the country, but they are just part of the equation. Hundreds of thousands of killed people in the last 22 years. There are a lot of factors and circumstances uh, where violence appear always as a shadow. So I did a cartography of that. In this image, we can see a detail of Morelian Michoacan, where you can see a lot of different interests and violences that have, been, have to be negotiated on the territory. But I did this map for the country as well, where extra this um, mining, industrial production, strategic highways, infrastructure, organized crime, drug dealing, and migration dynamics are represented. The map was recovered by William Brinkman here with us to create the exhibition that we did together, Devastated Territories. And next to the map, 32 boxes were located on the floor. Inside the boxes were written some messages with, uh, which forced visitors to bend over each box to see some interventions and to read the messages. Uh, when people get to the exhibition, they said how beautiful it was, but when they leave, they told me how sad and ugly and violent country Mexico is, and how useless they feel facing Mexico's territories. Most of all, they could see how the negotiation of interests uh, within a weak government represents in a war zone. In 2008, I did a map of Spain and Portugal making homes in the city that had a financial crash in the 2008 financial crisis. With Mexico is just an example of, of what is happening in other countries with different intensities. All the Spain and the financial crash lead us to the financial housing is produced. How behind the wall of a financial housing unit, we can find violence on an infinite planes around the neighborhoods. And we can see behind the walls burning planes, which reminds me of Yaman Yamas or Burning Planes, an incredible book by Juan Rulfo, where e emptiness and vacuum are shown as the principal context of the 20th century Mexico. And the next burning plan, and, and next to burning plan, planes, he wrote Pedro Paramo, a book where the dead people live together with the ones who live. The deaths 
that we celebrate in the Dia de Muertos give context to the most interesting literary expressions of modern and contemporary medicine. So the Walking Dead piece work for migration as well for many other circumstances in Mexico. Using the same examples, if we have the, the possibility to see all these images together, then we can know that Mexico's territory is a very complicated mess, which basically is impossible to explain in terms of modern and democratic values. And I, and I also think that this is this can happen in many manner, in many other countries with different intensities. At the end of the day, in my opinion, the political, academic, and historical narratives are broken. We can feel the solution on what needs to happen before we have a better place and on the complexity that implies dealing with this context in the everyday life, we can close our eyes or look in another direction, knowing always that impossibility frame development. I believe that this dialogue between art pieces can be read as an aesthetic experience. And I also believe that it is the best way to communicate and to bring up the will to move on political convictions. But political conviction in others are not my job. Probably the only thing I can do is to provoke, to create the critical conditions on the status quo and to create metaphors of a devastated territory. And please don't get me as a pessimistic. As I told you, I produce without any overarching theory and without agendas. The dialogue between my artwork can set different narratives and show another reality as well. For example, I asked one of my daughters, to create a new history with my artwork, and she did this day. Captain America is fighting to protect citizens from the bullets shot by the walking dead who live in the suits, spider webs, but they costume to pass undercover as anyone else, but only Superman can distinguish them from the rest. After all, architecture has been for me a kind of disciplinary prison where my senses were systematically affected in a way I stopped saw the whole and I just was able to see details of the whole. Probably the epistemological approach of architecture pushes us to stop seeing everything and focus on technical aspects. I cannot fight with that, but for me, this liberal and defined way to see things has been always a change. But also the traditional way to deal with architecture and urbanism has been the leading aspect of my doubts and probably leads my schizophrenic way to interact with my country. Migrants have been doing their own space of representation. They can live in holes named yongos, cohabiting with the spiders and scorpions. They can play with the shadows of a tree and have birthday celebration. They want to be invisible to the system, but at the same time, they participate in their human condition as everyone does. If we See closer, as photographer Hans Maximiliano Musiel did, we can understand how blind we are. Migrants can share with us a better future, beautiful expectations, being nice people, having good work and being responsible, being good looking and cool, having fun. The same dreams and wishes that everyone has. We can see ourselves in their faces. Migrants, are, a deep, are the deep witness of our times, but they are out of rationalistic approaches. The flow of life cannot be captured by any discipline. When I have an architectural or urban commission, I, go, I can go back to what is expected and just reproduce what everyone, everyone already wants from them. But I am not successful in creating wider perspectives from the, these disciplines in an architecture or urban labor environment. Somehow, it's exciting for me, speaking about this in an architecture faculty, first because as long as I understand you are working with themes out of the disciplinary box, but also because our contexts are much more complicated, uh, complicated and com contradictory than any discipline ca can afford. We can uh, expand our gaze and produce new ways of understanding and new ways to approach complexity. I am sure that in the future, architecture will show up in a different and more progressive way. Thank you very much.
much. Twice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, masses. Ah, oh, there we go. Yes. So, are there questions, comments? Oh, yeah. Which is massive order. Why? Always. I guess I wanted to ask um, amongst the entire presentation, you showed the map of routes uh, that I think you worked with with Professor Kapari. Uh, I was just wondering what was the research behind it and how do you like? Manage to people with these different um, routes of what this happened. Yes, uh, well, the, the, the procedure to do that map was like really uh, tough. We spent at least two years searching for different uh, information to shape this map. All this map has, uh, it, it was shaped in, 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 in I can put that in Archis. Archis is a, a geographical reference program, so you can do maps there. They are amazing. So we did these maps in, in Archis. Uh, for two years, we were uh, just getting all this information, analyze it, and then bring it up to a map. And then we uh, uh, transfer this map to Illustrator, and then we did this map in Illustrator as well. So we have all the information. Um, yes. And follow up. Question. Yes, of course. And regarding this research for this map that you did and this information and the senderos that you talked about with migrants. Yes. How these two intersect? They cannot intersect because because it's impossible to to uh, to trace the senderos. The senderos are like the, the walking trails of the people all around the country, and well, probably you can see them in. in in Google Earth, it will be possible to do a map of that. Um, at least in this map, it, they, they were not represented. Um, but you can find, um, I, I have a lot of work with Senderos because uh, they are these underrepresented kind of spaces. They already exist, but they are out of the maps and they are also out of the imaginations. And, and probably that's my, my best um, approach to territories. How we can manage to work with these spaces that are out of any academic or political representation. They are out of what we have in mind. So probably we should start doing narratives in there. So if I might, there's yes? the, the, the part of the map that was very interesting that we find that Arturo found out was that as he was mapping things that were out of the ordinary, like feminicide, but not out of the ordinary, but things that you wouldn't usually map together, like feminicides, um, lithium, yes, me and Lings, uh, Lings. where lithium is, where copper is, where oil is. So he would uh, he would put all of these uh, things in a map and what would turn out, um, there's very interesting information on, um, I don't know how to say this the correct way, <laughs> how to prosecution. Perfectly fine. Okay. Um, as a prostitution and where women were killed and where migrants were killed. And what you would see is that they would all bunch together. So lithium and fracking and uh, right. houses and, and, and migrant deaths, you could see them just cluster around the same kind of activities. And that was shown up uh, on the map. So, so that gave some of the very beautiful um, shapes. Yes. And at the same time, what we should say is where we didn't find any uh, mines or, or extractivism kind of uh, resource, uh, there is peace in the country. I mean, uh, probably the the idea of these drug dealings, uh, these organized crime, uh, we are always linked to, to the drugs or to the weapons. But uh, what we find in that map is that probably the violence is much more propagated by, by mines, gold mines, uh, carbon, I don't know, say carbon, carbon mines, lithium, etc. And in that pre precise area, when you have all these resources, you have like the worst violence in the country. So we can think that this representation of drug dealing is not exactly the, the one. 
Yes, please. Right. You're familiar with the concept of blood letting, right? No, I have a little can, can, can I can say in Spanish to you? Yes, please. Okay. Saben cuando los aztecas agarraban y pasó una presión del futuro, desagraban a alguien. Ah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's sangre. Yes, yes, yes. So if you see these places, right, of urbanism as a blood letting urbanism, <laughs> yes. What can you foresee? Because you've seen violence as one medium or information that is given out of, as a prophecy, like what you see coming to these places. Well, I I don't really know what is going to happen with these little houses in these places, uh, these financial housing. I think we are doing a complete mess in the country. And I am not able to have any kind of solution. Just to, to point out that probably um, our disciplines uh, are in a way uh, superadas, how do you say that? Uh, overwhelmed. overwhelmed by reality. And, uh, and probably this is a way to start a solution, to recognize that our disciplines, any discipline in Mexico, the political discipline, etc., are, are not able to attend what is happening. Like data or competence? Or probably um, recognition of uh, our capacities as a society, as, a, as, in, as, as an intellectual, as disciplinary approaches to complexity. Um, probably we should start talking about, uh, between uh, different disciplines. Uh, I mean, uh, how this problem is seen uh, by anthropologists or by philosophers or by writers or by all, any other discipline. And probably uh, most of them will have a, a not so very good version of the, of the places, but at the same time, they will have a different approach. And, I, and what I think is that we need to expand um, our disciplinary boundaries in many different areas to attend what is happening today, because uh, I don't think that rational can, can attend the, world, the, the problems that we have. I think that reality is overwhelming um, and stressing the life of everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. So, in a sense, do you want to add architecture? Basically, our practice, do you want us to kind of consider the reality of the environment rather than trying to create a simple community kind of societies and structures that will like? Uh, I, I think I am talking about myself and my own frustrations because, because well, I, I can, I, I probably, I, I care about the world and, I, and that's something that, that I don't recommend to anyone. And um, so when I, care about the world, I, I try to find solutions. And what happens is that I studied architecture and urbanism, and I didn't find any solutions from architecture and, and urbanism, but trying to solve the world. And the architects are, uh, one of the things we learn to be an architect is that we have to solve problems. So, so probably what I am saying is that um, um, these disciplines are um, um, perfect to attend particular things in a specific field um, um, work, in a specific boundaries. Um, but at the same time, this discipline is, uh, needs to be powerful, much more powerful, to really affect the context, to really create changes. And we were talking in the in the workshop with Martin about um, a project that they have with a with a NAP. And I think that sometimes um, this app was for migration. I, I won't uh, speak about that because uh, probably I will be uh, really wrong. But when you see uh, apps such as Airbnb or Uber, they really transform the cities, and they are. Uh, uh, thinking in a completely different kind of approach to spaces and to cities. And, and probably we need to expand our gaze, or probably we need to focus just on what we learn to do. And this is good, and this is 
right. And you don't have to care about the world as uh, you have some sad people as me that can deal with that. But but I think uh, any profession, any discipline should be enjoyed by the people. Uh, no, it's not that obvious. Uh, but for me, uh, study architecture and urbanism leaves uh, my interest to in understand the context of the inhabited. Uh, these places and to see what is happening there and try to find other ways to approach. Okay. Yes. Your, to, to continue her question here, your critique or your revealing of things becomes a form of critique, which is one that is systemic. It looks at a greater causes for the phenomenon in the center, at least reveals that this is not simply what we appear appears on the surface in fact it might be invisible yes but then wouldn't the argument be that if if i am participating in those greater systems in reproducing itself over and over in its built environments am i not a participant then yes, in that and and is there I, you know, somehow you said there's a, there's a choice in here, I suppose. Yes, of course, uh, um, you, you can have choices and you can, but I think that, um, well, I don't Maybe I rephrase it as, if you were writing a letter to a young architect, exactly. yeah, well, what would you say, in, you know, in terms of her dilemma? <laughs> yes, of course, to enjoy it, to enjoy it, because everybody, everyone would find a way, and of course we are part of of everything and I think when you are studying and you are uh, uh, students, you should see a lot of different views and gazes of the world and the, and the way other people are approaching to the problems and how we can look uh, by different means the, the place in we are living. So, so probably we can care a little bit about the world and we can act. In, in, consequence but at the same time we I mean um, you don't have to, to worry as much as I do for for the world I, I mean I, I was I was doing as I told you uh, with any overarching uh, theory I, I, I enjoy working with materials it's really physical and somehow it shows in front of me and shows that and uh, well, probably my, my daughters can do a better uh, narrative of my work, of course. But uh, uh, I think it's interesting how to how to create a work that, in a way, it's uh, um, it's shaped together in a really blindness kind of way. Because I am not doing a piece thinking that uh, news will be presented in two years or that I did a piece that will be related with another piece in, in 10 years. So everything is just like appearing. And, and I think it's a, a kind of confession of my part because um, sometimes I, I don't feel comfortable to say that I am an, I, I, I work with art. So for me, this is a kind of confession to, well, yes, I am doing this kind of stuff. And I don't know, as I told you, if I want to be part of a contemporary art scene, because I don't know if this is going to play. And I don't know who is going to see this world, but I really don't care. This is the way I approach to territories and the way I, I produce, um, I think, a testimony of what I see. Uh, you have a yeah, just, yeah, sort of following up, but we had a dream about the future of architecture education. You know, are we too limited now? Like, what should we teach the next generations? Like, your dream. Like, I mean, I can see your path. But yes, are we too limited in what we're teaching? I don't know. Probably, I, I, I think I will. I, I will in a um, incredible uh, situation. I will. Uh, try to, to create an educational system that uh, mixed a lot of disciplines. I think um, that we can solve particular things by, like really easy. Uh, I think the technology that we have already can uh, 
deliver a lot of solutions. And I think we, we should start thinking in different ways and have uh, information from different disciplines. But I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Yes. Um, do you see any uh, long lasting effects of like these, these mites in space? Because I just showed that like, you know, yes. like, um, Sandero, Santa Fe, the gradual unveiling of these is, is kind of dangerous to me because you know, the migrants are supposed to be a 10% of the world, little with the institution. Um, and the institution, I guess, is trying to catch up and try to catch the migrant. Of course. Um, so, um, like, what sort of I guess precedence do you think this this sets where um, migration in the future? Well, I think migration is a is a historic uh, is the history of the world, and I also think that we have a lot of versions, and we are not going to invent. In, I think that. Uh, if you search for what happened in mig migrations in, in history, you will find a lot of places that are out of the representation who, who were like the governments or the institutions that were trying to do with these things. So um, in the future, I see much uh, more unrepresented kind of spaces. I think I think that the people will uh, try to find places where they can be invisible, but at the same time they can have a life. They they can hide have the flow of life, and this is happening. I think everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. Mexico is particularly uh, a really critical place for migration because you have uh, the U.S. Uh, north of the border, and then you have Latin America. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a place of, of uh, migrations and, and, and mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot of expressions about that. But we, we should start stop thinking about migration uh, in the traditional way, because if we think on this phenomenon, we are going to, to think probably in the, in, the, in the first image, uh, the walking dead image. No? Um, so probably we should uh, learn a little bit more about them as the photographer I presented. Uh, he used to have a lot of you know, photographs of migration in parties, uh, celebrating birthdays, uh, walking, uh, talking with them, trying to understand what would be the, their wishes. Um, probably we can break the traditional representation that we have migrants as well as the spaces such as Nyongos break the way we can understand the space uh, for migration. Nyongos are uh, the, the, the better example of how they are out of any disciplinary approach. Yes, I think there was a question. Yeah, there was a question. Uh, I, I didn't, do you feel like an outsider? No, from architecture and urban. Yeah. No, I I used to work actually as an architect in urban planner. I I did uh, huge urban plans, and I have the opportunity to travel around the, the country and uh, visiting a, a lot of places because of that. Um, I have been trying to quit from architecture and urbanism. But uh, the way I live and the way I can earn money is through architecture and urbanism. So it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, but 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 I'm not an outsider. I, I can see this from from, from a, an architect and a practitioner. <laughs> Incorporate a bunch more professions and uh, specializations and uh, create the ideal architecture curriculum, such as uh, including much more philosophy, okay, in, in structure, wherever, um, and you know, trying to get the full context of where exactly they're building. Um, recently, we got um, Carolyn, um, we have a studio dedicated uh, to abortion. And I asked the, the people there about the guests who will come and visit. And I asked them um, uh, to 
people in our class, like, has anyone who has visited and talked to the people in that studio actually had an abortion? So now, and the answer was pretty much no, or they're not sure, of course, person, person, whatever. But another thing, when you talk about crime in Mexico, um, don't you think it, it will be very hard to create ideal and ideal curriculum with people from academia who don't necessarily always come face to face uh, with these problems? Yes, of course. I, I mean, uh, I think you are doing a very uh, good question, very good comment. Because I think we have to uh, inquire the epistemological approaches of disciplines. How can we approach the problems that seem so far away from us? Okay, how can we speak about migration if we don't we, we are not in that place and we are not living in that situation? And at the same time, I think. Uh, anyone can be uh, a witness of what is happening in migration, both the migrants. And I don't think that we can um, uh, get all this experience into a disciplinary, any disciplinary boundaries. So yes, the question is very good. How can uh, academia or how can uh, political agendas, or how can other kind of approach to the problems can deal with something that they don't know. Um, from my point of view, we have to do um, uh, the efforts, I think, in academia all around the world to manage to do different kind of approaches, different kind of epistemological approaches, so we can uh, deal with reality uh, from, an, from another side, because the, the, the side that we are working with I think it's uh, it's a fine, and they can do whatever we know to do as architects or urbanists or engineers or whatever. Um, and it's a very technical and very precise kind of knowledge. And as a Zoom, as I told you, what, what, what happened with the broadcast? And I think for my uh, approach, uh, it's not a problem of architecture. Probably in this case, it was my problem. And I wanted to see these places and I went. But I don't think that this should be like a, a, a general. I mean, not, not everyone has to go to the, the worst place in the world, complicated place in the world, to see what is going to do. Probably no one asked him to go and see. And, and, and that happens uh, with me. When I was working in formal settlements, a lot of colleagues were asking me, what are you doing there? Uh, what kind of projects, what kind of urban plans, what kind of strategies are you uh, trying to create to, to, to make these norms better? And I was telling them that I was not trying to solve anything. I just want, wanted to witness, and, and that's my approach. And I don't know, probably we should build another kind of approaches. I don't know exactly what academia should do. But your question is really... there is more, yeah. um, Thank you for this talk. I have, um, yeah, it was really super interesting. I have two comments, two questions, and I want to just focus on one because of the direction I see the, the comments and the questions is taking. Um, and my question is about your, your method um, of writing and of archiving your, your, your photographs. And I say this because I do think that you are um, more um, uh, more disciplined than you give yourself credit. <laughs> <laughs> you are um, and more interdisciplinary in your methods than perhaps what you acknowledge. Um, I say this because because of the way you do research. Um, and, and it is a descriptive task. It is, uh, you, you leave the, 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 the task of, of, of solution, of, of solving the problem at the door, which is what other social scientists do, not architects. <laughs> and, and you go and you look, and you look, and you re report, and you witness, and you describe, 
So perhaps um, I, I'm super interested in, in learning about, yeah, or hearing something about your, your writing. Yes. And the way you, yeah, you do your, your archive. Well, the, the writing is a very systematic way to do it. And of course, it, it's an, an epistemolog epistemological approach, of course, because at the end of the day, I recognized, and I was telling you in the, in the lecture, that uh, it is a systematical way to, to work. And the writings, um, uh, there is a writer, a French writer, uh, George Perec. I don't know if you have read him. He has an incredible book. Uh, the name is Spaces, the Species of Spaces. And uh, from that book, he, if you read it, it's like an instruction to describe places. So I make an adaptation of that uh, book as an instructive way, uh, instructions to write. What should I see when I am in a particular place? And from that instructions, I write. So always I write like the same kind of things in the same kind of order. But what is interesting is that some of the things I write are things that I only can perceive, the smells, or hearing something, or the feel of the wind. I like to see animals. I, I love to, to, to write about the animals I, I, I see uh, in the places because uh, they really move freely and you know, they kind of prejudice. So I, I, I love them. Uh, so um, yes, uh, I, I write a lot uh, with this uh, discipline in a way. Um, Yes, that, that's it. Uh, of course, it's a way to, to witness. Uh, but but the but it's interesting because uh, much part of much part of my writings have to be with the, the way I feel when, when I'm in these places. Not so much uh, if this place is exactly exactly the way I am describing, but I am uh, like writing how I perceive it. So. Uh, this make it completely uh, strange and impossible to maintain or to have a, a, a rationalistic argument to maintain that the place is like the thing I wrote because at the end of the day I was right. I am. I was writing uh, what whatever I was feeling to, uh, in, in front of this place. And I, I am think I am sure that when I am happy. The writings are happier. I am not so happy uh, than the writings are. Sad. And I, I, yes. Ah, thank you very much for your talk. So, this uh, comment on interdisciplinarity, uh, as you know, you are the last lecturer of the period of uh, academics, activists, architects that actually work in the same territory from different perspectives. Uh, some of them, you know, you have, uh, as I understand your method, established certain distance from the territory. Also, you are uncertain. And then as an artist, you express your feeling in, in your artwork. And, you know, we were witnesses of like different people who different, that belong to different disciplines that also have an approach uh, to this territory. So I wonder if, like, if you're method into inserting how other people see and live and produce and experience the same territory uh, and how those can actually influence your perspective on your territories, you know, what is power, what is agency, what is culture, uh, what is life. Yes, well, I think, I, well, I, of course, I have been working with a lot of colleagues in uh, the academic work, William, guys in a seminary in Croatian that we did like three or four years ago, five years ago. Um, and I also like to um, talk with people when I uh, go to these places, but I'm not forcing anything. I, I am not doing that kind of talk research. And I don't like to, to be an anthropologist to go to a place and ask the people uh, how they live. Uh, 
in that case, I'd rather the, the, the of course, the anthropologists listen, but probably like the idea of a psychoanalyst, they also listen, but not, nobody asks, or in the case of the anthropologist, nobody asks them to listen anymore. And they go to the places and they bring up with them all of their disciplinary boundaries and they create a narrative from, from the disciplinary boundaries and for asking others whatever they are wanted to, to ask. Um, I don't like, if you see in the images, it's very difficult to see persons in the photographs. I don't like to, to show persons as, a, I don't know why, and I don't want to, to make my interactions with this person part of my research in a way the things I can see and, and learn in these spaces um, are a completely uh, um, distortion kind of version of the place because I come from another place because I I am getting there by because I have interest and no one really asked me to be there. So I don't want to bring up this uh, experience of these people, but nevertheless, I have been doing some pieces with, with people. I, I, I did a piece in Twitter, a written description in Twitter of a place where a, killed, a murder was done in, a, in these little houses in the one neighborhood. And, and I talked with a lot of people and they told me always the story in a different way. And I have, uh, as many stories as people as I talk. So it was clear that it was as well a mess in terms of information. And what happened in that murder? No, really nobody knows. Uh, so I don't want to bring up uh, that experience. So just try to be uh, like the source. And, and I, I am not going to know the way they are living, the people are living in these spaces because it's impossible to, to do that. You have to be there and live there. And so I just go to these places and make my description. That's it. Whatever happens from there, yeah. just come back. We have time for one more. Martin, do you want to ask the last question? I mean, you're almost going to answer them here, but I think the talk of thinking about students about abortion and so forth. And, you know, when you have a site in architecture, if somebody's to design a school in Harlem, then we go and see the school. Uh, it's goes to the site and all, but it's also to the, you know, social context so forth. The work of migration, it's, there's also a lot of empathy that's being put into the curriculum. <clears throat> it's difficult to do that because of the mode. There are certain topics that we deal with in education where I think when we met you, we had just come from Chavez with 20 students yes. that been migrants. So we didn't just bridge. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. So there was interviews with migrants and so forth. And uh, it was very tough for the students of us, but it was, there's a, my question is sort of this, how important is a level of empathy is in the education? Well, I think it's fundamental to have empathy with what is happening with with the work because the techniques that we can learn, uh, they are tools to, to survive in a way, but at the same time, tools to uh, produce some kind of architecture, urban design, whatever. But if you don't have empathy, it will be impossible to really uh, have a better perspective and to, uh, and to act in a, in a most ethical way. Um, so I think it's, it's really, really important. Uh, to be in fact, but work back with. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. If anyone needs the continuing education credits, that's in the room. They're out there. Yeah, we're doing that.